Hello! I'm so glad you could be with me today in our Unfolding the Word studies as we continue verse by verse to work our way through God's amazing Word. We're in the midst of an extended study of 1 John, pressing forward now in the final chapter of it, uh, moving toward the end of the book. I'm going to pick up our reading today in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6, and read through verse 10. We'll finish our look at those verses today. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by the water, but also by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater for this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. We've been looking in these verses at testimony, proof that God has given about the truth of the gospel the truth of who Jesus Christ is and what Jesus Christ accomplished at the cross. The biblical principle, and God has affirmed it a number of times in the scriptures, is that important claims require evidence. Important claims require testimonies. We saw how in the Old Testament the example of a claim that somebody has taken somebody else's life or requires the testimony of two or three witnesses. We've seen in the New Testament the claim against the accusation against a spiritual leader in the church needs the confirming evidence of two or three witnesses. God says important claims need the testimony and proof of witnesses. And therefore, the gospel claims, which are the most important claims of all of life, all of eternity, need witnesses as well. Even though, again, I've said to you before, the very fact God said it is testimony enough. We either take God at his word or we don't. But God goes even beyond that. And he says, listen, I've given some further confirming evidences of the truth of the gospel claims. Four evidences, in fact. Last time, we looked at the witness of the water and the witness of the blood and saw how essentially the reference here is to the, at the water baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's verbal witness that this was indeed his son. And then at the shed blood of the cross and all of those events surrounding the cross on through the resurrection, we saw a unique confirmation from God that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be and that the gospel was in fact affirmed through all of those events. Now today, we want to look at the third of these testimonies for the truth. Notice how he puts it here. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. Testimony number three from God about the truth of the gospel comes in the form of the inner convicting work of the Holy Spirit about the truth of the gospel. What's he saying here? What's the focus? The focus is this. There is a clear testimony, and we'll call it a testimony. There's a clear testimony from the Holy Spirit about the truth of the gospel whenever anyone hears the gospel. When they hear the gospel, they have a convicted heart about it. The Holy Spirit convicts the heart, convinces, in other words, the heart, that the claims of the gospel are true. Think about how this is put in the Gospel of John in chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. And when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they don't believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. All right, what's the point? God said that he has arranged things so that when one hears the gospel, they will feel convicted about its truth. Everyone who hears the gospel 
is convicted about the truth of the gospel. But to feel convicted about the truth of it, which is God's divine work through the Holy Spirit, that does not force an individual to act on it. That conviction, in other words, is not irresistible. I can know at the deepest level that it is true, and I can steel my heart against it. I can shake my fist at God and refuse to bow the knee to repent of sin and receive Jesus Christ as Lord. I have that option. What I don't have an option about is whether I feel convicted at the deepest level of my heart about the truthfulness of the gospel. God said, I've ensured that there will be the deepest confirmation to someone through the work of the Holy Spirit when they hear the gospel message. So if you're looking for that confirmation, that's where you'll find it. The confirmation of the truth of the gospel. So here we have three testimonies that God has given to the message of the gospel. The testimony of the water. The confirmation at the water baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. The testimony of the blood. All of those events surrounding the cross. The subsequent death. The resurrection. And now, the testimony of the Holy Spirit's conviction within one's heart. Those three testimonies all agree. They're all supporting one another. And God says, that adds this confirming evidence for the truth of the gospel, which commands us to repent and believe. But then God goes even further, and he says, if you act on those three witnesses, those three testimonies, then you repent and believe in the gospel, then I will give you a fourth testimony. It's not a fourth testimony for those that reject the gospel. But for those that have responded to it, who've acted on the conviction of their hearts, have taken God at his word, have repented and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, I've got another testimony for you. And the fourth testimony is this, whoever believes in the Son of God as the testimony in himself. What is that testimony? An inner change that came from responding to the gospel. When we respond to the gospel, accepting the witness of those three witnesses, God gives us this fourth testimony, a testimony within our own hearts. The Holy Spirit works within us to witness to us that we are the children of God. Now, John's already talked about this earlier in First Epistle of John, and so this isn't a brand new idea, but God is repeating it to us once again. The Holy Spirit in the life of everyone, convicts them about the truth of the gospel. But that same Holy Spirit, in the life of one who has repented and believed, confirms to them, not only convicts them, but confirms to them that they are now the children of God. Confirms to them that they've been changed in status from merely creatures of God into being in the family of God. That Holy Spirit working within the life of a believer enables them to now respond to God as Abba Father, their true Father, their loving Father. The ministry of conviction is the third testimony. The ministry of confirmation is the fourth testimony. So we have four testimonies. The water, the blood, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and the confirmation of the Holy Spirit for those that have repented and believed. So here's the point. Are these four witnesses enough for you? Are they enough to confirm the truth of the gospel message? And here's another point I'll make. What else must God do to bring about repentance and faith in someone? He has given us the wonder of his son. He has confirmed the work of Christ on the cross. He has given all of these testimonies to its truthfulness. People will stand before God without excuse for the gospel they've rejected. God has done all that he needs to do to confirm its truth. 
And he ends the passage here, these, ten, these verses I was reading to you, with this caution. When a person rejects the testimonies about it, they add to their guilt by this reality. That rejection of the gospel is the same thing as calling God a liar, because that's what you're saying. God is saying you're a sinner and lost, and I've sent my son to die for you. And you say, well, no, that I don't believe that. You're a liar, God. I'm not that bad. I can be saved based on some other basis. You're a liar about the truth of the gospel. What terrible, terrible echoing condemnation that will be for the individual who refuses the four witnesses to the truth of the gospel. Well, join me next time, and we'll continue on in our study of 1 John as we talk more about the promise of God about eternal life for those who believe. God bless.